everybody, Wayne here. In today's overview and review, we're going to take a look at In the Name of Justice, The Battle for Lewis, 1264. Designed by Dale Gutt and published by White Dog Games. This is Dale's first published war game. Before we get started, I do want to thank White Dog Games for providing a review copy for me to show off to you all. Now, let's set the stage. England in 1264 was in a time of rebellion. The barons, highlighted by Simon de Montfort, Earl of Leicester, were revolting against the autocratic King Henry III. Both sides marched around England gathering their forces until May, when the king and his royalist army reached Lewis in southern England, where they halted and waited for additional reinforcements. The baronial forces, led by Montfort, engaged in a night march and were able to launch a surprise dawn attack on the royalists. They fought outside of Lewis, primarily on Offham Hill, where the steep terrain hurt King Henry III and his army as they had to fight uphill. Historically, an initial charge by Prince Edward and his heavy cavalry did rout the left flank of de Montfort's army, but Prince Edward pursued the routed forces too far, which allowed de Montfort to concentrate his forces against King Henry's remaining army. They were eventually defeated, and King Henry III was taken prisoner and forced to give up some of his royal powers. Now, in the name of justice, it's a grand tactical hex encounter war game of low complexity. There's about four pages of rules um, that seeks to simulate that battle. The game uses a chit pull system, which makes for increased playability and helps simulate the drama and chaos of medieval battles. Now, we're going to go ahead and do a quick overview. I'll cover my pros and cons, then I'll give you my final thoughts. Standard format for my overviews and reviews. Now, I do want to say that in addition to a normal recon, of course, I also have a tutorial uh, partial playthrough for a much more in-depth look at the game. So while I will do an overview here, if you want to see you know, how everything goes and watch me play through about half of a game, go ahead and check out that video. Otherwise, let's continue on. All right, I have the game all set up here. Let's kind of look at the map first. So you can see Offham Hill up here. You can see how the terrain, um, the elevation changes. Darker is taller elevation, and then it kind of gets lighter as it gets down to the, um, the plains or the valley here, the town of Lewis. And what we have set up is we have the Royalist forces. You can see the King Henry III here, represented with this counter. And then up here you have Simon de Montfort and his Baronial forces. So the Baronials in gold, the Royalists in silver. Um, terrain is a huge part of this battle. So with the map, um, specifically the hill and the elevation changes. So you may not necessarily deal as much with some of the swampier areas, the stream over here. It doesn't usually happen. It could depend on your game, kind of how you maneuver your forces. But the big part of it is going to be the hill because... You have the barons, the baronial forces, they're up here on the hill. They have the high ground. Um, no Star Wars references, please. And then here, going uphill, you have, you know, the royalist forces, just like it was historically. So that's going to be a big part of it. Now, hex and counter, right? You have your regular traditional counters. Let's take a look at them. You have infantry. You have cavalry. You have um, two types of missile slingers, and then archers. And we'll take a look at them quick, and I'll probably have some graphics pop up for you guys as well. So you can see, pretty standard. Um, you have three numbers on there. It's going to be a combat factor, morale factor, and movement factor. Obviously, you can see cavalry, higher movement factor than the infantry. Um, the missile units here are going to have a lower combat factor than the regular infantry. You are also looking at, when you flip them over, a reduced side when they are when they take a hit initially they're reduced gonna lower their numbers if they get a hit again they're gonna have to roll against the morale factor to see if they are eliminated from the battle eliminated and or routed now the units themselves pretty simple right you're moving around hex encounter it's chip pull right so what you're doing is each of those leaders henry the third cornwall and his, i'll cover the leader units quick here Prince Edward, etc. They're going to have a movement factor on them. No combat factors or morale factors. Just a movement. You generally will have them stacked with your um, the ward that they're a part of. And that's a big part of it. Is if you look now, you can see, not only do we have the two different sides, we can see the forces are kind of grouped, right? Each one of these is a different ward. Which, each ward will have a leader. For instance, Cornwall leads his ward right here. Prince Edward leads his ward right here. 
happens is you're drawing for the chip pull. You're going to go ahead and draw one of the leaders. And so when you draw Prince Edward activation, you're now going to go ahead and activate Prince Edward in his ward. How that works is you check for, and I'll run through the phases now of the turn. Pretty simple. You check for command and recovery. What that means is you can see there's a blue number on here. That's his command range, also called influence range. For Prince Edward, it's three hexes. What that means is at first when you're checking, you're checking to see how many hexes away, whether units are in command or not. If they're out of command, you put a marker on them. In command, perfect, no penalties. And as like most games, if they're out of command, they have some, some penalties to them. You're then going to check for recovery. So if they had been reduced, you may be able to roll against the morale factor to flip them back over. Then you can do your movement. Again, pretty standard hex encounter, right? You're moving them around the map. Defensive missile fire, non-active ward. So your active ward, when you're moving it around, you have to be mindful, the enemy, wherever they are, if they have missile units that are within range, they get to go ahead, no matter how many there are, they get to go ahead and take shots at your ward. So always keep that in mind. Then you do your offensive missile fire, and then you do melee combat. Melee combat, simple. You're adding up the combat factors of your attacking units, dividing by the combat factor of the defensive units. You come up with a combat number. You go ahead, you know, check on a basically common results table. Roll a 1d6 with modifiers. 1d6. You go ahead and check your modifiers. And there's going to be different things like terrain, um, leadership, depending on, you know, an army leader versus ward leader versus a subordinate leader. There's a nice chart that comes with the game. You check that. Go ahead and give it a roll. And it's going to tell you what happens. No result, hit, or eliminated. Eventually, you're going to draw the end turn chit. That's going to go ahead and end the turn for you. Turn track here, depending on which setup. I, I call it scenario before in my playthrough video. It's not scenario. Um, it's just different setups. So there's a designer setup and like two different historical setups, depending on where the units are. Basically, those will have a different start time. And you play all the way until either 4 p.m., the end, so play through all the turns, or once one of the army leaders is captured. So take a look at a couple of... The leaders again. We looked at Cornwall before. His different numbers. If he's captured, so if the unit that he's with is eliminated and an enemy unit moves into that square, he's flipped over and placed with an additional unit, or excuse me, with a different friendly unit. What that means is Cornwall was captured and his IR, so in this case three, goes to the other side, which he's a royalist, so it would go to the baronial forces. Then there's a new subordinate leader that is now with the forces. If he gets captured, also he goes, and then all the ward may be eliminated. They all may be removed from the battle. However, if you have an army leader, which is King Henry III for the... Sorry for the a little like sunlight coming through on the outside. Um, if you have an army leader eliminated, you flip him over. Oh, captured, rebel victory. And the same goes for Simon de Montfort. If he's captured, it's a royal victory. So do not let your army leaders be captured. If it makes it all the way to the end and none of the army leaders are captured, you know, causing an automatic victory for the other side, you go ahead and add up all those IRs and the one, the side with the most wins. That is a very quick overview of the game. Again, if you want to see a more in-depth overview of me running through everything, explaining everything, and then playing through half a game, please go check out my tutorial playthrough. Um, that video is up right now. Otherwise, let's continue on to my pros and cons. All right, as usual, we'll do cons first. Things I didn't like, things I, th I thought could have been done better. So first off, you're doing the chip pull, and I mentioned this already, but as you're doing the chip pull, you're always allowed one full activation. So like one, drawing one, and activating that ward. After the first one, you put the end turn chit in the cup. Well, the rules say you put it in there first. If you draw it, you set it aside, draw it, whatever. So either way, however you do it, you get one, right? Like get one ward to activate for sure. Then you throw the end turn chit in here well there's only i believe it's 10 chits including the end turn chit i mean sometimes you will draw one ward and then you get the end turn okay turns over you go to the next turn you know draw one put it back and you may draw it again i, I had a game where i only had one or two uh ward activations multiple turns in a row so you know with that by the end of the battle you know sometimes in that particular game that i played I would have wards that didn't really seem to get enough activations. Now, 
I'm not an expert on the battle, but from what I've learned of it, you know, from my reading and just kind of seeing, you know, watching little videos on the battle, just learning about it, right? Like learning the history, all the forces, they really had a good chance to become engaged. You know, no, nobody was just sitting back and didn't have a chance to act. Everyone did. Everyone did a lot of fighting, a lot of maneuvering. Um, that was a big part of the battle. So with the end turn shit, I like that it's in there. So you never know exactly when a turn's going to end. Um, you know, I'm okay with not having every ward gets activated every turn, but maybe there could have been a little bit of a different way. Maybe, you know, two or three minimum activations, something like that, instead of just saying, okay, only one, because that's an hour in between, you know, hour turns. So you don't have one ward activate in an entire hour. I don't know. Another uh, con of mine, historically, Prince Edward, um, son of King Henry III, by the way, he had his heavy cavalry over here. They launched, they actually launched their attack ahead of the rest of the Royal Army, and they routed the left flank here of the Bronio forces, and they chased them kind of off the battlefield, right? Well, there's no guarantee of repeating history here. In fact, because of the, the chits, you know, with the chip draw, you only have a one in nine chance of even doing that with the rules as written, like the base game rules. Now, the designer, he did include some optional rules, one of which describes how Prince Edward was impetuous and to have him conduct the first turn's only activation. Uh, and I like that. I do like that. However, I just feel that the activation rule should have just been part of the regular game rules. The goal with War Games, right, is always to stimulate history first with a chance for other options or outcomes, not the other way around. I just, you know, spent a lot of time with a game, Thunder at Dawn, that has many special rules for the first few turns. And that's Thunder Dawn is the American Civil War game that covers the Battle of Wilson's Creek. In that, the Union launched a surprise attack against Confederates. And so you have the Union activating when the Confederates really, they're literally, quite literally eating breakfast when the attack happened. So, you know, you have where the Union gets to do multiple activations first, multiple turns first. Maybe I could have seen that in the base game just to make sure that, you know, hey, you're at least trying to simulate history with the optional rule maybe to say, okay, forget that only draw from here to start the game. Uh, third, the terrain, um, specifically the various elevation changes, while very clear on the map, and I will talk about the excellent art later in my prose, it does sometimes get covered by all the counters when the battle is finally joined. Uh, since the uphill downhill of your opponent is such a huge part of the battle, and you need to calculate those combat modifiers with every combat, you will find yourself constantly lifting the counters to check unit elevation. Keep a pair of tweezers handy. A quality of life change would maybe be to make the map and the hexes larger so that you could see the elevation changes even with the counters on the map. I like that it's not a you know full-size map, that it's kind of just like a mid-size map. I do appreciate that. And everything fits in the counters well, or excuse me, the, like the counters fit in the hexes. You know, they fit well right now. It, it looks good. But trust me, once it's one big mass and it's lines of fighting here, you're going to sit there and be lifting them to be able to check the terrain. Finally, the rule book, it's a bit vague in places. Um, that has led to, you know, myself and others having to ask multiple clarifying rules questions online. Normally, Board Game Geek is kind of my go-to. Since the rule book is only four pages, four pages, excuse me, as is, I kind of wonder if maybe the designer could have added another page or two to really flesh out the rule set. Having a very small rule book like this is really only a big plus. If the rules are clear, the game is easy to learn and play. Maybe a missed opportunity there. All right, on to my pros. Speaking of rules questions, the designer, Dale Gutt, he's stepped up and given detailed answers to any question on Board Game Geek. He not only answers the rules questions, he often provides reasoning, historical information with his reply. Kudos to him for that. Always love seeing a designer support his game after it's been released. The components, as usual for White Dog Games, are good quality, as they use Blue Panther for their printer the quality paper, the map, and the thick counters. We've talked about this before with any game printed by Blue Panther. It's a nice thick, they punch pretty easily, and they're a nice thick, um, kind of like a layered, almost like a wood piece, um, combination of like wood and like a really just a layered paper, but very, I mean, very thick, very nice quality. Absolutely, you know, no problems with that. However, I do want to make a special call out to the artists who worked on the game. Um, Jose Fora, Mark Mahaffey, Mark... Uh, Haffy, I believe, yes, and Jonathan Carnell. 
they did a fantastic job from the map to the unit art. The map's easy to read and it's functional while still maintaining, you know, really solid artwork. I especially like how the river and water stands out on the map. The blue offsets the browns and the light greens. Although the water's not a huge part of the battle, I just like the look, right? It draws your eye in. I think looking on camera right now, it looks good. And sometimes on camera, the colors are more muted, but I think it looks really good on camera. It looks just as good in person. Um, and Offham Hill, which was a huge factor in the battle historically, you know, I talked about the elevation, it's illustrated very well. Elevation changes, which are incredibly important to the movement and the battle, you know, the combat system, they're easy to see at a glance. Maybe a little more space in between, but when you just look at them where you only have a few wards fighting at once, very easy to read, very easy to tell what elevation people are on. Um, it's only when everyone gets grouped together that gets a little harder to see. I also want to make an extra special mention about the unit artwork. I simply adore them. Now, I think it's just simply some of the best unit artwork I've seen in, really, frankly, any game. I just love it. I think it looks great, very clear, brings a lot of character to it. Um, I love it. So each unit, as you've seen, has a clear, full-color illustration of the unit type. You know, the knight, you know, heavy cavalry, infantry, archer, slinger, along with the coat of arms for that particular ward. All right, so you have these different coats of arms on there. And finally, the background on the, on the, on the counters, you know, the colors for the two sides. It's a beautiful and easy to see, you know, silver up here, gold over here. Not your usual kind of red and blue, blue and gray, etc. The look of the map and the counters just brings the medieval theme to light. And that helps draw me in, draw me into the game, draw me into the history, make it a better experience overall. Uh, finally, the game turns, they play quickly. You're never overwhelmed, thanks to the light rules. You know, rules, questions aside, you know, you draw a chit, you activate a ward, you move into battle with, you know, half a dozen units or so, some of them less, really. Then you draw the next chit. Once you have the flow of the command movement combat down, your turns are going to fly by. You know, Hex Encounter games, they often take a long evening or multiple days to play. But once you're comfortable with In the Name of Justice, you can play an entire game in an hour and a half, two hours, maybe an hour if you do draw the end turn chit quite frequently. That's it for my pros and cons. Let's uh, wrap it up with my final thoughts. All right. In the Name of Justice is a solid, although admittedly not spectacular, medieval war game. For every plus, such as the beautiful artwork, there is a minus, eh, the middling rulebook. While this isn't the type of war game you need to own, if the history interests you, or you are attracted to the artwork, or the chip pull mechanism, you know, being so solitaire friendly, you will want to play it. Check it out for sure. Now, make no mistake, the game is far from a stinker. After my first game that I played, as soon as I was finished, I set it right back up and I started a new game. That's That tells you something, right? Now, if the theme interests you, you're going to have fun with it. And thanks to the chip pull driving the game and the lack of hidden information, like I mentioned before, it's really solitaire friendly. So definitely recommend it to solitaire players who want to look for solitaire friendly war games. Also, the designer, Dale Gutt, he needs to be recognized for his work on this. As a first design, job well done, Dale. Is it perfect? No. But for a first design, trust me, I'm not going to throw too many complaints at him. Good job. Now, there just aren't a lot of medieval war games, especially solitaire friendly ones. And maybe because of that, I found myself enjoying this one a lot, despite its flaws. I do see a number of things the designer can improve, most of which I've mentioned here in my review. And I hope, but I, what I hope ultimately is that he takes this system, you know, takes any feedback, not just from myself, but from others, you know, tweaks it, polishes it, and gives us another medieval game, improving on this one. This is a great base of a game. You know, this is a great game to kind of get started with his system, get started for him as a designer. And it's also clear to the designer, he has a passion for history. And I'd love to see him continue to improve as a designer and share that love of history with us. So thank you, White Dog Game, for providing this copy. Thank you to you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed this overview. Hope you enjoyed my other videos on the game. And let me know below. 
Are you going to check this one out? Have you yet? You know, if you bought a copy, are you going to? Um, if you already had it, what do you think of it? I know there are some other people out there that have been enjoying the game, but I'm hoping this video can bring the game to a little bit wider audience. Again, I don't think medieval war games get a whole lot of attention sometimes, and I think that's a shame because although a lot of times with medieval battles, they don't have quite the same scale as you saw with either Ancients or you see with more modern conflicts, um, really starting with the gunpowder age, gunpowder age, I still think you have a lot of fun with it, and I know I definitely had fun with this one. So thank you everyone for watching. I sure appreciate it. Comment below your thoughts, what you think about anything, and until next time, later.